first of all, I have to tell you that I'm not a neuroinformatician. So the talk I'm going to give you is probably a little bit different from other talks that you, we've been hearing from yesterday morning. But um, I'd like to tell you something about what we, how we have found and what we have found recently using um, some other people's um, data set. And also, today I'm going to focus more on cortex, sorry, it's not going to be thalamus, but which is more about the thalamus and cortex um, circuit development. So I've been interested in um, looking for and then finding what is the molecular mechanism which is controlling the um, cortical um, area wow. development. And as you can see here in a really um, um, cartoon that was just really summarized in an easy way, that um, among um, different um, um, species that basically they look quite different from size-wise, and also if you look at the functional area, they look kind of very different, but at the same time, you can also find um, a common um, area, such as um, primary sensory um, cortex or visual or auditory cortex. And on top of that, during the evolution, they basically make the brain, um, the, white, uh, the field, bigger, and also they make it more complicated, such as adding new areas, like for us, um, for those areas which deal with the language um, processing or higher cognitive function. So basically, I was interested in for many years, like what is controlling, what is the molecular mechanism which is controlling this kind of diversity of the cortical, um, functional cortical area. And um, for the early developmental time point, we actually now know that a lot of the, the gradient of the morphogen and transcription factors are actually mainly controlling um, like an anterior, posterior, and medial lateral patterning. But moreover, um, what the question remaining is, what is more and what is different among different species? And um, before we go into that, well, um, um, we actually noticed that even in, in the same um, conserved um, functional area, such as some of the sensory area, if you look those um, um, detailed structure and then circuit in different animal, you can actually find they are quite differently organized within the conserved somatosensory area. So for instance, um, some of you who are coming from Australia probably are familiar with this animal like platypus. If you look at their somatosensory cortex, you actually can find this stripe pattern, um, which is a topographic representation for their mechano and then um, uh, electric receptors, which is having the stripe pattern on their beak. And also, if you look at the star-nosed mole, this is the animal which is in, um, mostly living in North America. Um, you can find uh, they have very interesting structure on their nose, which is these um, um, appendix, have like um, 11 and um, also other 11 appendix on both sides of their nose, which they use like their hands, basically rather than their nose. And while um, they're hunting, they use this um, structure quite a bit. And, um, and also, if you look, there's some of the sensory cortex, you can also find pretty much some um, similar pattern of these appendix, which is like 11, you can find 11 stripes in one side. And um, the most well-known um, structure you can find in some of the sensory cortex is rodent spring. Here, as you can find in the, some of the sensory cortex, you can find so-called barrel cortex in some of the sensory cortex, which is a representation of these um, whisker, uh, nose, uh, facial whisker um, um, representation that you can also find in thalamus while they're making connections to thalamus to cortex. So. Um, as you can see here, they're all, these structures are all in somatosensory cortex, but depends on what kind of peripheral structure they have, they also have different kind of organization in somatosensory cortex. So we decided to focus on this question, okay, then how they can make this kind of different connectivity. The first thing we did is we thought that, well, well since they um, have this um, structural organization, we thought that probably, and they, which is happening in early, um, which is control in the early um, developmental time point, we thought that they should have some molecular mechanism for that. So we use um, Allen's Brains Atlas and Gene Paint and others um, people's um, website and keep looking at if whether there are any specific molecule expressed in the barrel um, structure, especially in the barrel hollow, which you can find in here, or in the barrel septa, which is in between those two um, barrels. And um, these are only for some example that we have found, but we actually found good numbers of candidate we can start to work on. Then we decided, for today, we decided to focus on this molecule called BDBD3. So um, at this time point, when we have found, we decided to work on this molecule, we actually didn't know anything about this molecule. And, but the reason why we got interested in this molecule is, um, sorry, it's 
really wiped off, but um, it's uh, really clean in situ. I hope you can believe me. Um, this uh, BTBD3 expression pattern looks really interesting to us because they have very specific expression in a barrel cortex, as I explained, and the rest of the cortex is pretty clean um, um, beside the cingulate and also perf uh, um, piriform cortex, but there aren't any individual cortex. And then why we got interested in this is when we decided to look at BTBD3 expression pattern in different species, because our question is how these um, circuits get developed in different um, pattern in different species, we decided to look BTBD3 expression in common marmoset. And when we look um, BTBD3 expression in neonate common marmoset, which was really striking, so besides the somatosensory cortex and auditory cortex, they had really strong and um, expression very specific to the primary um, visual cortex, especially in layer four neurons, which is a layer they receive input from the thalamus. So um, if you, in the previous figure, again, that you can see that there's no expression of BDVD3 in mouse visual cortex, but they have strong expression in the, um, the common marmoset from primary visual cortex. So what it means, this is a question we decided to ask. But before we go into that, we, just, we had to um, find out what's the function of BDVD3 in the mouse um, barrel cortex, because this is the animal which is actually easy for us to manipulate with. So once again, just to re um, re remind you like uh, the circuit for the barrel cortex, Cortex. Um, basically, these input from the whisker reach the brainstem, brainstem to ventral basal thalamus, and they reach the layer four cortical area in the somatosensory area. If your cross section here, here is, um, um, please imagine this is layer four cortical neurons, and here is the somatosensory um, barrel cortex, uh, sorry, bar um, barreloid. And um, from the barreloid, it will, from each patch, they basically project thalamocortical axons reaching into the um, layer four cortex, and they make this kind of clusters that we can identify in later stages as a barrel cortex. And um, for the recipients, um, for those cortical neurons, which is sitting inside of each barrel, like here, they basically are receiving input from everywhere. So basically, they can keep their dendrite elaborating everywhere. Okay? However, these um, um, neurons, which is sitting on the edge of the barrel, like here, basically, they have to change their morphology looking toward to the barrel hollow because this is the side where they're receiving more input. However, there's no thalamocortical axon from the ventral-basal thalamus reaching in between the barrel's um, septa. Instead, there's other axons which is coming, uh, running through from the posterior medial um, thalamic nuclei here. They run through and then reach to the superficial layer. Moreover, um, layer 2, 3, neurons which sends from projection to the um, contralateral side of the cortex actually needs to run through the in between this barrel um, hollow. So basically, they for these guys, they don't want to make connection with these two different kind of um, projections, so they basically keep to stay away from this structure. So this is what's happening in the barrel cortex. And once again, I told you we got interested in this molecule, BTBD3, BTB domain containing molecule. I told you that at that time when we started working on it, we didn't know anything about its function. However, um, they, um, the, the protein family, which called BTB domain containing family, um, had like 200 family members, and some of them are known to uh, um, function as uh, transcription factors and so on and so on. <laughs> Basically, they had a lot variety of um, the functions. However, we couldn't find any domain in BTBD3 which we can predict its function. However, um, when we looked at those, um, these two papers, which was published um, a little bit before, um, they have found this BTB, other BTB POZ domain containing family member called abrupt has ability to control the dendritic morphology. So this actually made us think like, well, since this BTBD3 is expressing um, specifically in the barrel um, cortex, why we don't test, why do we don't manipulate BTBD3 and test the dendritic morphology in the barrel cortex? So. Um, the first thing we did is generated BTBD3 SH construct. We did electroporation into the developing mouse cortex. We did electroporation at E13.5. This is the time when layer 4 cortex is generated. As you can see, um, quite specific expression um, is um, happening in the layer 4 cortex. And with using this SH construct compared to the control side, you can see um, quite um, huge reduction of BTBD3 mRNA is happening here after SHRNA electroporation. So um, in the control brain, now you can see like this is the one barrel, and as I told you, these neurons, which is sitting on the edge of the barrel, needs to stay away from the barrel septa and keep their dendrite looking toward the barrel hollow. However, when they lose or knock down BTBD3 expression, then this is what's going to happen. Basically, the dendrites start to ignore the barrel septa, and then they elaborate their dendrite everywhere. 
Okay. So it looks like BDBD3 has something important to control the dendritic morphology and the barrel cortex. Okay, then the next question, what about individual cortex, which we have seen um, strong expression in a common marmoset, but not in the mouse. To test the idea, we decided to do the um, ectopic expression of BDBD3 in the, visual, in the mouse visual cortex and see whether they can change the dendritic morphology or not. So here's the experimental procedure we took. Um, so again, we use the electroporation um, technique to put um, BDBD3, and this time it's overexpression, so it's um, um, functional BDBD3 construct, electroporated in the visual cortex, again at E13.5, and then we raised them till P14. And then we did a monocular deprivation for these animal, and then look at the morphology um, in, in between this binocular region and the monocular region. So the basic idea is, if you do the monocular deprivation from the contralateral side, um, these uh, monocular region here are receiving from this side, basically get more silence. However, um, this eye, which is in the contralateral side, open eye, or, I'm sorry, um, the ipsilateral side, which still have their input coming in, the spinocular regions are still active. So they, we can make the contrast of the neuronal activity here. Um, this side is higher and this side is lower. So we looked at the neuron, which is sitting on the border of these two regions. And um, in the control animal, basically, those, um, whatever you do, even if you do the monocular deprivation, these dendrites do not respond to neuron activity and then change the dendritic morphology. So whatever you do, they have these symmetric pattern of the um, dendrite in the visual cortex. But when we put um, BTBD3 in the visual cortex, so basically we force them to express BTBD3, and what happened is they start to respond to neural activity and change the dendritic morphology. So with the um, Witcher magnet in tracer, we know that the right side of the screen is receiving input from the open eye. So basically, these neurons are responding to the open eye column and try to send the dendrite to the higher neural activity side, which probably they, can, they think they can receive more input from this side, but not from this side. So for the efficient um, circuit formation, probably it is um, worse for them to change their dendritic morphology in an early postnatal stage. Okay, so now in mouse system, we know that BDBD3 is functioning to control the dendritic morphology. It depends on how they're receiving neuronal input and make efficient circuit. But what about these animals, which have strong expression in um, BDBD3 in the visual cortex? Is it also the same in these animals, which make their visual cortex working more efficiently or not? That's the question we wanted to ask. So, um, just to remind you, in the visual cortex for these animals, like um, um, marmoset or ferret or cat, they have beautiful ocular dominance column, which you can't see in the mouse on um, visual cortex. Um, so basically, the ocular dominance column is um, organized by right side and left side input, which make this stripe, stripe pattern. In a critical period, if you do the dip monocular deprivation like here, basically those um, open eye column gets bigger, and the um, column which is receiving from closed eye, which is get, uh, gets smaller, like here. So what about, um, if there, are there any um, function for BDBD3 for forming the ocular dominance column, and also the, the changing the dendritic morphology within the ocular dominance column? So, um, so, of course, the straightforward, um, the straightforward way to test this calm idea is if we can manipulate the common marmoset visual cortex, probably we can answer it right away. But at this moment, it's not that easy technique. So we decided to use um, different species which do have ocular dominance column, and we decided to use ferret. So this is actually an animal which um, is very well known and used for um, studies for many years, having a beautiful ocular dominance column. So their developmental time points are a little bit different from mouse, but we align it and define the um, corresponding time, um, developmental time point compared with mouse and decided to do um, electroporation on these animals. But before starting doing um, electroporation, we had to check um, BTBD3 expression in these animals as well. And like um, common marmoset, we found they have strong, um, strong expression of BTBD3 in some of the sensory cortex and also strong expression in the primary visual cortex as like marmoset. So, this part is actually put in one slide, but this is our three months work to try to establish um, ferret in uterine electroporation. But actually, it end up, um, um, we end up using exactly the same protocol with mouse. So basically, it was quite easy, I have to say. So um, here you can find um, electroporation technique, which is exactly the same as mouse. Um, use a, um, inject the plasmid DNA, whichever you want to use, into the ventricle of the developing ferret embryo, and then um, place electrodes in this way or whatever, wherever you want to um, electroporate, and then zap. And basically, then put them back and then raise them and 
collect them till the age, you know, wait them till the age you want to um, look at. So here's an example how the liquoration is working. So you, um, it's a little bit hard to see in here, but this is a right hemisphere. Um, we try to look at in wide area. Here's like a visual cortex, some of the sense where you can f see some of them are already start wrink making the wrinkle, unlike um, the mouse brain. And if you um, com using the different combination of plasmid, you can also make it to um, label sparsely like here. Um, then you can get the single um, cell resolution to see the dendritic morphology in a better way. Okay. So here's our real experiment, what we had done. Again, just reminds you, this is the BTBD3 expression at P12, um, postnatal day 12, that there are expression in somatosensory and also strong expression in the visual cortex. We generated ferret version of SHRNA construct for BTBD3 to knock down these BTBD3 in the visual cortex. So we electroporated uh, E34. This is the time point when the layer four get generated in ferret. And then we electroporated SH construct here. And then you can find um, they greatly reduce uh, BTBD3 expression specific in the visual cortex. So you can do the target, knock down in ferret. Okay, so in control case, um, here is not the monocular deprived um, animal. This is control animal. We did a sparse labeling of uh, visual cortical neurons with using electroporation. You can see these are symmetric pattern of the dendrite in the uh, control animal. But if you do the monocular enucleation to make the uh, ocular dominance shift in one side or the other, and what happened to those neurons which is sitting in between those um, column, open eye column and um, closed eye column, what happened is basically they are receiving input from one side but less from the other side so they change your dendritic morphology toward the open eye column. So here the right side, again right side of the screen, we know that was weaker maglitinin injection to the retina, it's an open eye column so they shift their dendritic morphology. Okay. So finally, on a BTBD3 knockdown case, what's happening here is basically they stop responding to the neuronal activity and they cannot change the dendritic morphology anymore. So I think this is a really convincing um, um, data that BTBD3 is, um, basically BTBD3 is important to change the dendritic morphology toward the active, um, um, the site which is receiving more active um, accents or um, input. And also the function of BDBD3 is conserved among different animals. So it depends on where you have um, expression of BDBD3, you can change the circuit formation um, in the different area part of the brain. For instance, some of the sensory cortex in mouse, visual and ferret, um, and also in the marmoset. And also if you think um, how these animals live, um, basically these guys, um, for those people who's working on the visual um, system in mouse, I'm sorry to say, but their visual um, system is not that great, I have to say. I'm not saying they're blind, but compared to the sensory cortex and their tactile, they are actually, I have to say, like tactiles are more sensitive to than that. And especially when they're, this is the early postnatal stage, when they're born, they basically need their um, whiskers to find things in the direction and everything like that. And also their olfactory system as well. So I actually have a belief that they, that's the reason why they have strong expression in the preform cortex as well. And, and these animals actually, um, they, as you know, um, these animals have an ocular dominance column. They actually rely on their visual input quite a bit from the very early postnatal stage. Especially common marmas, if you look at them, their eyes are already open from their day one and they respond to the visual um, input. And then also they're a highly socialized animal. But, um, they vocalize pretty well, so they need to well, they, we say they chat a lot because they really communicate each other, not from, with, only with their family, but with other um, family, which is separated in cages. They really chat each other. And they hear pretty well, very sensitive to the, um, the sound. So probably that's the reason why they have this expression in the auditory cortex as well. So it kind of makes sense that they have BTBD3 expression to the area where they really do heavily rely on their very early um, postnatal stage. And probably that's a kind of key for them to, um, to get better viability. Okay, so now um, I would just want to, using like so on one, two minutes, I'd like to show you what we're doing right now is, um, so basically, to answer our question is like how the different um, cortical um, areas are developed or how they organize, um, the, in, even in the same year, how they get organized in different way. If we can understand how BTBD3 um, gets their um, expression in different area like this, probably we can answer some of those questions and that is one of the projects we are working on, on top of a more um, detailed mechanism how BTBD3 is functioning. 
Um, the other thing we are working on right now is this is just one of the example that how we are processing our um, research. And we actually noticed that was looking um, other some um, people's data and also for the marmoset we are doing um, all over in situ by ourselves and then tried to build up our own data set. And um, what is important and what also we noticed that is actually the expression pattern, um, I mean gene expression pattern is very different, quite different in marmoset and rodent with a very simple um, comparison. So here's just a collection uh, for the um, autism risk gene, just um, probably, I thought that many people get interested in this kind of thing. But if you just simply compare those expression pattern, you may notice, and so this is the visual cortex, it's conserved area again, but you can find they have very different expression pattern, not only because their layers are um, organized in different, differently, but different subsets of neurons are having expression or not having expression of the um, same gene. So basically, um, we say, we say like, you know, the genes are very conserved in a different um, species, but if, until you look at the detailed expression pattern, probably we don't know what exactly or how exactly they function different way in different species. And thinking probably that's the reason why it is causing um, such a different organization and a circuit organization in a different, even in the same area in a very different way. So this is um, kind of project we are processing further. Again, I'm not the neuroinformatician, but we are definitely appreciating all of these data set and using in these kind of way that I'm glad I had a chance to um, talk to you about this. Okay, <laughs> so here's my last slide. Here's all of my lab. Um, the past members and um, collaborators here for the mouse strains and here's um, the funding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. I was looking at your barrel cortex data. It struck me that what you've described is beautiful for the limniscal pathway, but of course they are the paralimniscal and possibly extra limniscal inputs as well. Do you believe the same rules apply in those cases as you've shown for the limniscal inputs? So um, I think you're talking about this pathway from the ventral basal and posterior medial pathway, right? Well, um, I didn't know um, at this moment that from what we have right now, but recently Dennis Jabodin from um, um, Geneva um, University published about that, how the um, BPM neurons and PMM neurons are controlling uh, those um, holo neurons and septa neurons in the molecular basis. So it could be, so what we're thinking right now is this molecule BDBD3, which is expressing the barrel holo, is controlled by the BPM neurons. So if what he is saying is POM neurons also have something to control to turn on barrel septa neurons. Probably they do have similar mechanism, like who gets there and who turns on the gene in the post-synaptic um, neurons. So I don't know. I'm, I'm probably not answering your question, but we don't have those data, and this is what we are thinking right now. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, <clears throat> wonderful talk, and especially the last part because I do think that there is, a, I'll show something, <coughs> also an evidence for species specific, di species differences in, in gene expression. Uh, and so, thank, so I would like if you could elaborate a little bit more on marmoset. Why is it hard to do in uterine electroporation? And I think it's an important question because there is a discussion, at least in the United States, whether marmoset should be used or macaque monkey. And, and, and there are, marmoset has many advantages. Right. So, and you are probably world expert in this. So what are the problems with using in uterine electroporation in I mean, because it's small brain, I mean, for primate. It is very small. It's like a rat size, even in an adult, right? So, we, to be honest, we tried a few times, but it was not straightforward. Somehow they, I mean, we think, you know, it's small and it should be easy to handle, but we did a few procedures and then, you know, we failed, basically. Okay, so that's the uh, one thing we, we didn't succeed on um, doing an injury like operation, right? And why we're using um, Marmoset in our research, I thought that's your question, or, yeah. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so especially for the per people who's working on developmental biology, they're, um, the, you know, 
the first generation, turning the generation is one of the reasons why, you know, we wanted to work on it because each time they have three or four offsprings, you know, and they, um, once they are, um, they make couple, they're pretty monogamous. So they stay like that for like 10, 20 years like that. So they're very productive. So that's one reason. Once you get colony, you, you know, they always generate. Um, um, offerings. And the third thing, which I don't know, it's like, a, you know, to be a neuroanatomist, you know, it's not a good thing to say, but it's the brain's very simple. <laughs> so because um, probably you notice that they don't have many gyrus, so which is really easy for us to find specific areas and also specific layers and those kind of things. So for people who worked in mouse for many, many years, actually it is very complicated for us to look at um, like a, a macaque brain and human brain, for instance. So even finding which location was very difficult. But I found doing by myself, marmoset is very easy doing that. So those kind of re multiple reason, you know, is the reason why I'm interested in. Yeah. Thank you. Last question. Hello. Um, on one of your gene expression maps, I noted that um, this gene BDB3 seems to be expressed also in the mouse hippocampus in certain yeah. Yeah. areas. Can you say anything about its potential functional role and whether it also appears in other rodents at the same location in the hippocampus? Could it be, but um, one thing is, you know, it's also known that in hippocampus they change the dendritic morphology depends on the input. So one, one thing easily if people can think is probably they are doing a similar, you know, thing. But also if you look at uh, different species, they have slightly different expression pattern. So on top of that, they might have different functions, but honestly, I don't know about that. I'm waiting for our knockout mouse to come to see, you know, when probably we can get better idea or a little bit faster way. So you're waiting for that. And I think you're asking for those questions. It's not only in the hippocampus, they also have strong expression in cerebellum, just for your information. Yeah. Say yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what triggers? What is the activity dependent trigger of the expression of this? Or, um, so or the, how expression, is the expression during development. So the expression of BD, BD3 is not controlled by the neuronal activity. Once axons come in, then they get turned on. So we're working on that mechanism. So what, what is activity is doing, they change their translocation. So go, they go into some, we, first we thought that they were going into nucleus, but it looks like they're going into some subcellular um, domain, which is a insoluble fraction, so like let's say a centrosome or something like that. So they basically change, the, you know, the, the trans, uh, they translocate this protein, probably, we're thinking about, probably to the centrosome, which is actually a stem of the dendrite, father control ubiquitinase or some rho GDPS activity control the dendritic morphology. That is our guess. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you very much.